Good afternoon. I'm Kelly Waters, a health communications specialist in CDC's Center for Preparedness and Response, Division of Emergency Operations. Thank you for joining us for today's epic webinar on the 2019 National Preparedness Month. Today we will hear from Lee Krager, director of the Ready Campaign, and Ethan Riley, who works on CDC's Prepare Your Health campaign. If you do not wish for your participation to be recorded, please exit at this time. You can earn continuing education by completing this webinar. Instructions on how to earn continuing education can be found on our website, emergency.cdc.gov backslash epic. The course access code is EPIC0925 with all letters capitalized. To repeat, the course code to receive continuing education is in all caps EPIC0925. Today's webinar is interactive. To make a comment, click the chat button on your screen and then enter your thoughts. To ask a question, please use the Q&A button. The Q&A session will begin after our presenter has finished. Closed captions are available for this webinar. We are fortunate to have Leah Krager to provide an overview of emergency preparedness for individuals and families. Leah currently serves as FEMA's director of the Ready Campaign, a year-round preparedness campaign. She has six years experience with FEMA and eight years at the Mississippi Emergency Management Agency, including serving as deputy administrator. Leah, when you're ready, please begin. Good afternoon, can everyone hear me? Okay, I'm getting a thumbs up. And we've got some slides to share today. And I'm trying to make sure those are working correctly. Perfect. Um, as everyone may know, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. September, every year is National Preparedness Month. It started, of course, after September 11th in 2001. Uh, and we do this each year. We've got many, many partners now with our not only, <clears throat> excuse me, our state emergency management agencies and other federal agencies like HHS and CDC, uh, several cities, uh, county governments, even uh, several schools in different locations help us kind of celebrate and observe September to things we can do uh, with ourselves, our families, and within our community to make sure that we are all prepared for anything, uh, a man-made disaster, a natural disaster, uh, and that we're all getting the information out to the public so they can take those proactive steps. So we, we wanted to start off with um, is this year, we did uh, some, some campaigns that were really focused on kids. So I'd like to go ahead and play our national ad. We did a national ad in English and Spanish, and then we did four regional ads also in English and Spanish. So I believe if you can go ahead and play the national ad that was distributed. Okay, he's saying it's just taking a second to get the ad queued up. Sorry guys, we're hitting a server issue over here and it's not loading up from our server. So um, apologies for that. It's quite all right. I can um, talk around it a little bit and talk about the ad and if it manages to load. So we, we went with our theme this year um, and some of our partners internally uh, for child preparedness and, and preparing our kids and, and youth. And it wasn't just about for any big major event like a hurricane or a tornado, it was letting children be able to handle kind of anything that happens. So if they return home from school and there's a power outage, um, just that you could talk to your kids and your kids would be ready for little things. And that also helps them be more prepared for the larger things that can occur. Uh, so when we, okay, I think our ad is pulling up. So I will stop if we're able to run. Okay. 
chances are you won't be with your kids when it happens. Well, they know. The central and midwestern U.S. averages more than 850 tornadoes each year. And lately, the number of floods has been rising in the region, too. So chances are there will be more twisters and floods near here again. And between school, sports, and social lives, chances are you won't be with your kids when it happens. Will they know what to do? Ready.gov slash kids has all the educational tools and information to make the conversation easy. When the time comes, chances are they'll feel prepared, not scared. So talk with your family today. Thank you. That was actually one of the regional ads for the Midwest. So the four regional ads kind of targeted um, exact events that had occurred in those areas. Um, and these ads aren't really aimed at kids. And a couple people picked up on that when we showed them earlier. They're actually aimed at parents or caregivers or kids. That way you kind of realize to have the conversation. However, their animation, so we knew they would try and play well with children in a younger markets and with a lot of youth. Um, when we did focus group testing on these, we went to Oklahoma City and we went to California and played some different variations. Uh, the thing that kept coming up in the focus groups with parents was, oh, wow, well, I never thought I wouldn't be with my kids when something occurred. I never thought I wouldn't be able to get to them if they were at school or to be able to reach them and have a conversation with them. Everyone thought, yes, yeah, something could happen but they really thought they would be in a position to get to their children or they would be with their children when it happened. So it was even surprising to us that just parents kind of took it for granted. They would be able to step in in a parental role in any kind of an event dealing with their kids. Uh, so we wanted some ads to go out to kind of shake people from that notion to go ahead and have some, some type of conversation with their children, depending on the age level so they would be ready to handle different events that happen and, and things that could come into play in their area, especially. If we can go ahead and jump slides now. Okay, you can go ahead and skip to the next one. So uh, the video we just played along with the other regional ads and the national ad, they are all on the ready.gov website. And of course, at the end of the video, it's ready.gov slash kids. Uh, and it was really a kid theme. So if you look at that website later, ready.gov slash kids, you'll see um, compared to what it was just, you know, a month ago, it's a lot more interactive. It's a lot more colorful now. Uh, Pedro the Penguin, we've got his activity books. It's very popular. Uh, and this month, as you can kind of see, Pedro even did a takeover of FEMA's Instagram account uh, to kind of give some more tips for kids and for parents and, and caregivers and for us to really kind of push some of that out there. But we wanted to be able with this website to, to come at something and to give some web pages. You know your kids can browse them. They can go through everything. There's games on there. There's different interactive features. It's easier to search now. You can order Pedro the Penguin activity books. There's different brochures and we're even in the process of updating those and getting some newer material out but they're all there and easier to find. And it's also aimed at children at certain levels and at teens. So different parts of the website are really for older youth or you know, the in-between age or even younger, younger children. So there's something for everyone on the site. We tried to make it kind of very targeted for different audiences and so they could kind of find the niche that they uh, needed to. Okay, if we can go to the next slide. And so if you want to click on these, this will take you actually to the new uh, redesigned web pages we launched this month for September, the ready.gov kids. Or do I? And that's actually just the ready.gov link, but it's quite all right. So you can even, um, there's the ready kids search at the top of that page or you can even type it in, which, whichever is easier. So we've tried to make that. But if you look, the entire ready.gov site is easier for anyone to be able to navigate and get to. Here, here's more of the, the kids' pages. Uh, and if you'll do me a favor and scroll down, you'll kind of see the different areas, educators, organizations, families, anything for parents, the different games, um, and to the side of, of you know, you can kind of look for anything else you want or if they're looking for different tips for different events, those are all there and kind of laid out. It's a little, little better than what we had had it. And so we're now working on our Spanish site to be able to carry everything over, uh, which is listo.gov and be able to kind of fully flesh that out. 
um, within the next year. So it's kind of matching up to the ready.gov account. And then um, if you'll go back to the slide, there's a couple more links just to be able to show you. We've got the, I think the second one may just go back to the ready.gov link. The tips for individuals, families, and businesses. Okay, and the financial preparedness. Uh, and we did have uh, four different themes during the month, of course. Uh, the first week was financial preparedness. Um, we, have, we activated for our tropical storm and Hurricane Dorian earlier this month, so we had to reschedule our financial webinar. So that is now rescheduled for Monday, September 30th. So we've got some information about how you can register for that. Uh, since some of the stuff the first week of September was kind of delayed, but we work with a lot of our, our partner organizations. I am one thing that our former administrator and our current acting administrator had, had really hit on, especially after the 2017 hurricane season was uh, so many families just don't have any type of a savings account or anything even to cover their insurance deductibles or any other small emergency that could happen. So we're really taking it on, uh, especially the week one, to really strive to people to be able to put some money aside and be able to, to handle small emergencies and things that you need. Um, and for those of you who are interested, if you go back to the slide, our last link kind of shows you the toolkits and the social media items that you can use during September or your organization can use. We do try to keep some up-to-date toolkits online all the time, depending on what the event is for winter weather, hurricanes, thunderstorms, flooding. You'll see there's different preparedness campaign toolkits, uh, life saving kits. Uh, if there's anything you need that we're lacking or something that should be updated, feel free to reach out to us um, because we are trying to update things with some better graphics, of course, because stuff just becomes dated over time. And so we're doing a revamp now from when the Ready campaign started um, about 15 years ago with the Ad Council and looking over some of those videos and some of the stuff to kind of update, bring it more in line with what people are requesting and to make sure we've got the good graphics and, and items that are gonna help people get the information they need. Uh, and so last, we've got another one of our videos that's also online. We've got on the ready.gov site, you can reach all the videos and especially we've got them in different formats, the 15, 30 and 60 seconds. So this is another one that we did that we think is just kind of useful for everyone to be able um, in your organizations to use about building a disaster kit. Being prepared is a part of who you are, but it's especially important in the case of a disaster. It's up to everyone to build a kit that contains the things you need to survive, food and water, medication and supplies, as well as any important documents you may need. There's no one more capable of planning for your situation than you. Be informed, make a plan, build a kit, get involved. Visit ready.gov slash my plan. Okay, thank you. So uh, again, if you can, you just go to the last slide. On ready.gov, you can even type, type in at the top for videos and you'll see all of the ad videos. If you need a clean copy or version to download, Ad Council did produce all these for us. So if you go to the Ad Council's website, you can type in emergency preparedness videos and it's where you can download them, download for like network quality if you need to, to be able to replay them for someone. But several of the videos are in English and in Spanish. Uh, and we still have a lot of different language language options online besides those two languages just for your normal preparedness information. So that is all I've got to present. We can take questions or move on with Jonathan and Ethan. Actually, uh, we are going to go ahead and move on to Ethan and take questions at the very end. So everyone, please do enter your questions in the Q&A section. Thank you, Leah, for your insight on overall preparedness. Now we would like to welcome Ethan Riley to share CDC's advice on health preparedness for emergencies. 
Ethan Riley is a health communication specialist in CDC's Center for Preparedness and Response. His day-to-day -day duties include developing content such as the Prepare Your Health web pages. Prior to joining CDC, Ethan worked as a public information officer for the Arizona Department of Emergency and Military Affairs, where he first began to work on emergency preparedness messaging. Ethan? Yeah, thanks for that introduction and uh, thanks for having me and uh, for uh, the Ready Campaign for participating today as well. Um, so I was invited today uh, just to give a little bit of information about our uh, Prep Your Health campaign um, or uh, web pages, which is um, some new web content that we launched about a year ago. Um, uh, if you could go to the next slide. So uh, I guess the first question is sort of what is Prepare Your Health? Um, I can give you a brief, brief background on where it started. Um, working here at the CDC, a lot of great uh, emergency information that's out there on the cdc.gov website. And so what we wanted to do uh, is create a place, create some web pages uh, where we could aggregate all this great information, take all the information for uh, personal preparedness as it relates to things like asthma, to food allergies, to anything that the experts and subject matter experts here talk about and uh, research and find a place uh, for it and put it under this heading uh, that we call uh, Prepare Your Health. Um, Prepare Your Health is really all hazard personal health preparedness. There's three categories. Um, the first one being personal health preparedness, which is really sort of um, aligns with what we heard from Lee earlier about building a kit. Um, we also have a section that we title Plan Ahead. And that highlights the importance of emergency planning for ways to stay healthy, to stay informed, to stay connected in an emergency. And the third section is uh, called Create Community, where we talk about how you can get involved in various ways and how you can uh, care for each other and create uh, community health resilience. Um, you might have even seen our hashtag out there during Preparedness Month, uh, hashtag Prep Your Health. We've been using it a lot in uh, combination with the hashtag National Prep hashtag um, in our social media. And so we've really tried to um, brand those messages that we put out through social media as being Prep Your Health. Um, that said, today's presentation and the next few slides, I'm gonna sort of really focus on the uh, personal health preparedness uh, portion of Prep Your Health. Um, we do feel like we've only started to scratch the surface of what Prep Your Health could mean uh, as far as from a content perspective and what it could mean to this greater discussion about emergency preparedness. Um, so we're excited about where we, what we might learn um, from our various partners, including Ready, including all the different centers and offices uh, uh, that are around here. So um, can you do the next slide? Well, that's a nice transition slide. Can we do the next slide? Sorry. Um, so what is uh, personal health preparedness? Um, sorry. Um, as you know, emergencies, disasters, things like hurricane can cause widespread damage, long lasting power outages. Um, they can also strain public health and healthcare systems. And so personal health preparedness is about having the wherewithal, the supplies, the skills, uh, even the self-confidence uh, to withstand, adapt, and recover uh, an emergency. Um, when we talk about personal health preparedness, we, we hit on five sort of topics that we uh, informally call the five Ps, uh, personal needs, prescriptions, paperwork, power sources, and practical skills. Um, in the next few slides, uh, I'm going to do my best to explain what those are, uh, the messages that um, have sort of been generated around those topics. Um, but it's, it's important to remember that uh, anything we have on our, our site in our, is not an exhaustive list of the things you need in the kit. Uh, kits are obviously, the contents in the kit are personal. Um, they're unique to your personal health and safety needs. So um, your family's kit is obviously going to look and function different than maybe your neighbor's. Um, I often think, and I don't know if this is the best analogy, but I think of people's cell phones. You know, everyone has a cell phone, most people, uh, the smartphones, and you have the home screen. Um, I, I know that I've looked at my friend's home screens, and they look different than mine. Um, I have a friend that, uh, you know, um, has a disability and needs to use it with one hand. So the way it's even arranged, his home screen, and the apps he uses and chooses are very unique to him. Um, so I don't know if that's a great analogy, but it's an analogy that I, I sometimes think about when I'm thinking about what goes in a kit. There's no necessarily right or wrong answers to that. Um, so we'll, we'll try to, to hit on some of those, those, those P's here next. And um, I think we're ready for the next slide, yeah. So personal needs, as like I mentioned, these are the things, the stuff you need to protect your family's health in an emergency. Um, it's a long, long list. Uh, it all really starts with the, the food and the safe water, um, those basic supplies that uh, should be in a kit. 
Um, but when we talk about personal needs from that uh, prep your health perspective, um, we're also including those, your home use medical devices and assistive technologies, contact lenses, uh, hearing aids, um, talking about medical supplies, um, syringes, blood test strips, and a bacterial wipes, uh, and also uh, first aid supplies. Um, your waterproof bandages, tweezers and scissors, uh, first aid reference guide. Uh, the list really goes on and on as far as personal needs. Um, you know best what your personal needs are going to be in an emergency, uh, leading up to an emergency and in the immediate um, response to it. So um, you're the best person to know what your personal needs are. So uh, when you go to this site, uh, this page, it's really sort of a list, a suggested list, a list to get you thinking about what you want to have in your kit. Next slide, please. So obviously prescriptions are a personal need as well, but there's so much information that we felt we could um, pull it out and make a whole new section, a whole section about it. Um, obviously, a significant portion of the population takes a prescription medication. Um, so because of that, it's important that people seriously consider their prescription preparedness. Uh, a great example of uh, the need for prescription pr preparedness was Hurricane Florence in 2018. Um, we have, we do a publication here called the uh, Mor Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. And they uh, put out a report in July, I believe, where they did some research and they came back with 30% of hurricane related ED visits, emergency department visits in North Carolina during Hurricane Florence were for medic medication refills. So a uh, pretty significant number. Um, and again, just sort of a real life example of the importance of preparing your prescriptions as best you can. Um, as best you can includes talking to your doctor about how you might create an emergency supply. We know it's tough to do that sort of thing. Um, but having that conversation with your doctor and, and or your pharmacist is a good place to start. Um, also, the importance of making a list of your prescription and medical supply needs. There is a organization that we, that we sometimes work with, we've written, written blogs with. Um, Healthcare Ready has a great resource. It's something called, they call it Rx on the Run. It's a wallet card that you could go to their website uh, and uh, fill out and it it helps you print out a card that you can then stick in your wallet. It's got places that you can put information about your actual prescription, details about your prescription, contact information for your doctors and pharmacists, information about your allergies, any known, med any known allergies and your medical conditions. It's really just a tool, a great way to, to get you organized and get you thinking and have that on you, slip it in your wallet or um, your purse or whatever you may use uh, and, and have it on you. Um, Another important thing uh, is to get to know your emergency prescription laws, um, prescription refill laws, I should say. Uh, we've recently published a blog about this, a blog post about this to the Public Health Matters blog. Um, and some people may, may or may not know that uh, states have, some states have emergency prescription refill laws. They do vary by state, um, but some states do permit pharmacists to dispense early refills of certain med medications under an emergency declaration. So. Um, if you lived in a county that was under an emergency declaration for an emergency, a, a hurricane, for example, um, you may be able to go to your pharmacist and uh, work with them and they would be able to give you a, 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 an early refill. Um, it's, it's an important little thing to know. Uh, because it does vary by state, it's very important that you, that you reach out and uh, talk to your state public health department to learn more about the laws where you live. Um, like I said, we originally published a post that talks a little bit more about this. Um, but, you know, it's, it's important to know these sorts of things and then ask the questions. Um, next slide. Uh, paperwork. Uh, it's, what do we mean by important paperwork? It, it may differ, obviously. Uh, what we mean by it are the hard copies and digital documents and data that could help you prove your medical coverage, ownership, your identity, uh, or even just help protect your health in an emergency. Um, your health insurance cards. Uh, personal care plans. By those, um, again, this is where we learned a lot working with other centers here at CDC. Uh, the importance of having asthma action plans, the importance of having food allergy action plans, uh, cancer survivorship care plans, all these plans that you may have that would make a great addition to your emergency kit um, that can help you, obviously, in an emergency. Um, also, vital records. Uh, those birth, birth and death certificates, uh, again, to reference the, the, the Public Health Matters blog, we recently published a, a post uh, where we talk about the work the CDC is doing to improve uh, the types of information that is recording on death certificates um, so that it can help uh, investigators make the right connections, improve public health surveillance. Um, so there is some work being done to improve 
the collection and analysis of that information. Uh, again, that's, that's on the blog that you can get to. Uh, actually, I should give the website. If you went to cdc.gov slash CPR, that's where you can find links to that. Uh, next slide. Power sources, okay. Um, so obviously power sources are pretty common after an emer a disaster. Uh, on average, I think people experience something like four hours of power loss each, each year. Um, with a, a large scale emergency, obviously power, power outages can, can last longer. And as a result, for some people, they could become life-threatening, especially if, if, it's some, if you're someone who depends on a uh, home use medical device. Um, so we just feel it's important that uh, people prepare to be without electricity for, uh, for a few days. Um, that means having emergency lighting, uh, flashlight, headlamp, uh, battery operated lantern, many different versions of what safe emergency lighting is, um, safe heating alternatives, and uh, backup power sources for your cell phone, your refrigerator, if you can, and your medical equipment. Um, another one that I have on there is a uh, generator and extension cord. Um, a lot of messaging uh, from us and our partners here about the importance of safe generator use. Um, the reason for the accession cord is uh, they recommend uh, 20 feet away from your home, from any doors, windows, and vents. So that extension cord is just as important as having the generator. Um, and next slide. Practical skills. So last P, I promise. I, I haven't come up with any more P's between the beginning and the end of this presentation. Um, this is practical skills. Uh, when we talk about practical skills, we are talking about the, the things you can do uh, prior to an emergency that have nothing to do with supplies. These are things, skills, lessons you can learn, um, lessons and skills you can learn and teach others, share with others, and some of them practice every day to prep your health, to get prepared for an emergency. Um, it's a wide ranging category, um, includes life-saving skills, things like CPR, learning how to do abdominal thrusts, um, but the, the list goes really on and on, long, on and on, I'm sorry. Um, basic swimming skills, uh, how to use a fire extinguisher, uh, how to use an asthma inhaler, um, the proper way or the effective way to wash your hands. Uh, many diseases and conditions are spread uh, by not washing hands with soap and uh, clean running water. Um, how do you read food labels if someone in your family has food, a food allergy? It's important to know how to read those labels. Uh, seizure first aid. And again, like I mentioned, uh, safe generator use. Um, just to go back to the generator th thing, um, it's, it's a big one. Uh, unintentional, uh, non-fire non related carbon monoxide poisoning takes the lives of about 430 people, sent another 50,000 to the emergency departments in the US every year. So um, it's important when it's not an emergency. Uh, when it is an emergency, there's something happening, uh, occurrences uh, can spike. Um, in fact, to go back to that, that, uh, that report I mentioned, uh, MMWR uh, report that comes out, um, they had a report after Hurricane Irma in 2017 that there were 16 of the 129 deaths in uh, the states of Florida, Georgia, and North Carolina were uh, CO poisonings. So um, it is an important message. It's one we, we try to put out uh, as often as possible through our social media channels and uh, other channels. So that's the last P. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> what we did for Preparedness Month was a little different. Uh, that wasn't a traditional campaign. Um, we've tried to do that, uh, tr traditional campaigns, uh, social media based, uh, that were over the last two years because of the hurricanes and the activations that happened at the EOC were sort of uh, were interrupted. Uh, we just couldn't follow through with them. So um, we decided this year to uh, put the power or uh, empower our partners uh, to give the tools uh, to have a preparedness month campaign to our partners. And so we designed a, a digital media toolkit. I know FEMA showed a, a great list of their toolkits. This was our first, and it was on the topic of personal health preparedness. So the five P's that just went over. Um, you can get a link, you can link to the toolkit, again, from our, our webpage, cdc.gov slash CPR. Um, the toolkit includes sample social media messages, pre-sized graphics. By that, I mean graphics sized, uh, as perfect as we could get them to, to fit in your Twitter feeds and on your Facebook uh, Facebook feeds. Um, we had example blog posts and newsletter blurbs. And what we really wanted to do and we really worked hard at was uh, just bringing it to people's attention, uh, sharing it with state and local health departments every opportunity we could. Um, and it was really designed with them in mind, but we encourage everyone to use it. Um, we know that, you know, health, local health departments, I come from a, a local background. Uh, we know that 
sometimes, or I know uh, I can empathize that there's sometimes limited bandwidth, uh, the ability to create social media messages and, and graphics that are just sized right uh, can be difficult. We know that um, a lot of health departments uh, do participate in preparedness month, but um, I don't know that we've, you know, there's always been a whole lot of really health focused content that they could share during the month. Um, and the neat thing about the toolkit is that the information that's on there is evergreen. So it's not something that you can just, that's just for preparedness month. It's content that you can use year round to talk about how to prep your health, about personal health preparedness. Um, all the materials are free to download, are free to copy and paste. Um, they're optimized from web, like I said, and they're, they're ready to plug and play. Next slide. So just one more, one more comment about the toolkit. Um, like I said, this was our first. So uh, if you're a sort of a, a design thinking student or a student of design thinking, this was sort of a, a minimal viable product, meaning it was a, something that had features that we knew that uh, our partners would like, but um, it's really meant to have feedback. Uh, it's really meant to start a conversation. And that's what we'll be doing next is having a hot wash, talking more about the toolkit with our partners, again, particularly the state and local health departments. How can we improve the content? How can we uh, better the resources that we're offering? How can we bring it to more people's attention? Um, you know, one thing that we've already talked about and we didn't get to till later is syndicating the toolkit so that uh, you could actually copy it to your webpage. And then um, anytime we made updates to it, say add a new, uh, a GIF, it would uh, update uh, on our, whoever syndicated the content. So um, we are thinking ahead. Other topics, as I mentioned, Prep Your Health is more about, is not just personal health preparedness, it's also planning ahead and creating community. So we're already looking at the types of toolkits we can create around those things, those topics. Um, and that, I believe, is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ethan. We will now transition to our Q&A session. Don't forget if you have a question to enter it into the Q&A section. Jonathan, can you read the first question? There we go. I can. Actually, the first question <clears throat> is going to come from me. The first two questions. These are things we kind of anticipated might be a concern for our audience. Um, so over the weekend, I worked on a preparedness kit and I wound up spending more than I was expecting. Is there a concern that if people wait until the last minute before a storm or a snowfall, they might not have enough money to be fully prepared? Yes, it's not just a, a possibility, it's reality, and it's happened several times. Um, I remember Hurricane Katrina hit basically at the end of the month, and a lot of people, you know, were waiting on their checks. They received it the first of the month and didn't have money to evacuate the Mississippi Gulf Coast or things to buy that they needed to stock up on. So what we tell people now is it, you don't have to go out and buy everything all-encompassing today. Uh, Today, you can go buy a couple of extra, you know, cans of tuna fish or whatever it is, some kind bars. Uh, you can buy a little at a time, just like you put $20 back or $10 back a week in savings. If you do a little at a time and you know a certain area of your house and you've got these supplies in, it's going to be, you know, good for that time. So just keep a stock of items and routinely kind of refresh those items, take an inventory, what do you have, what do you not have, and what are the three most important things? And I would just start there and start very small. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> my next question, also for me, um, is uh, many people in our audience are in a position to encourage others to practice preparedness. So what advice can you offer for effectively encouraging people to get prepared to kind of increase the rate at which people are willing to take action? Sure, I think it goes back to the videos where we're discussing with the kids um, that, you know, so many hurricanes or floods have happened in your area, so many tornadoes, so many ice storms, that these things aren't just fake or myth, that these really happen. So what does happen in your area? And the best way to kind of understand that and understand how to get involved is what, what is going around in your community? And if you never have before, take a CPR class, take a first aid class. Um, there's several of those around. They don't cost anything. And just kind of make it your goal, the same way you're going to look at, you know, what do I need to have in my home? Is my insurance up to date? Uh, really kind of take inventory. It really doesn't take 15 minutes to sit down with your family to kind of do something, to have a little conversation, to get things started. And after that, it really becomes kind of routine and it's easy to do. And you don't have to take that 
one huge weekend or week out of a year and, and do a ton of things. Just have the conversations. What's in your community or what groups do you need? Or, you know, you can even start with, do you have a neighbor with a disability and how could you help out with them if they needed it? Thank you. Um, in addition to that, next month's webinar will be about overcoming message resistance. So anyone here, if you get the chance to tune into the October uh, EPIC webinar, please do. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna go to the audience questions now. We have a couple of questions um, for people who are looking to use some of these um, ads that encourage preparedness. And they're concerned that English and Spanish is great, but they would like to have it in more languages as well. Recognizing that that's, you know, there's a, there's a point where it's hard to get them made. Is there any future for um, possibly having some additional languages? Or is there an alternative for people who are looking to communicate in very specific, less common languages in the United States? Yes, and we have more languages on ready.gov with just some simple um, information and statistics. We don't have the videos yet, but yeah, that's always a, a possibility And as we're looking at different regions of the country. And I would even start with your local emergency management agency or your state. Is there a pocket of people or a group of people with some language barrier and that helps? And I'd start there to see what resources are there or what we need to make or translate and they can work with us. But there's lots of resources out there and a lot of things. So um, I would start with, you know, helping identify those areas and making sure first the local and state emergency management agencies understand those areas uh, and that community and that they can make sure they're getting the resources they need to start with. Thank you. Ethan, I'm gonna read two questions in a row. They're both related to prescription medications and will probably be relevant for you. Um, the first one is from Teresa who asks um, about recommendations regarding extra supplies, medications, devices, et cetera, when insurance will only co cover certain amounts at a time. And the next question comes from Kiana, who says, for states who promote being two weeks ready, encouraging people to have two weeks of disaster supplies, not only three days, what recommendation does CDC have for people to keep two weeks worth of prescriptions? Yeah, thanks for the question. I, I think, you know, we are in our content regarding prescriptions. Um, we think it actually uh, absolutely has to begin with a conversation between you and your doctor and your, and your pharmacist. Um, we understand that it, it's really difficult to cry, try and create a, uh, a stockpile of prescriptions, uh, as, as the, uh, the, the questioner mentioned, for three days, let alone two weeks. So it has to begin uh, as a conversation between your doctor, your pharmacist, and possibly even your, uh, your insurance provider. Um, you know, the other big message, and I, it, I mentioned it in my slides, is the importance of, you know, learning more about what your state emergency refill laws are. Um, for things like a hurricane where there is some advance notice, um, you and the state declares an emergency. And again, the laws vary by state. Um, it's, it's, it's helpful to know those laws and know what you can do in order to go and, and create an emergency supply in case you a had to evacuate or just couldn't get to your uh, your pharmacy because of a power outage or some other situation that would that would prevent that. So um, I don't know that there's an easy answer uh, or a one size fits all answer. So it is very much starting with a conversation, having those conversations, and learning as much about what you can do. Um, you know, even from again the state laws uh, as possible. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you. KC asks, is it a good idea to upload your digital records to Google Drive or other cloud storage? I do have several items uploaded onto a cloud. I just say, uh, be really cognizant of what material you have uploaded. Uh, what do you need to get to quickly uh, and fast? What do you really need in a hard document? And what do you need on thumb drives? Um, you probably don't need everything in a cloud, but I absolutely have things in a cloud. I think it's one of the best resources we have right now uh, to be able to, to get to things remotely and where we would need them. And we just didn't have that capability 15 years ago when something would hit or the home was destroyed, people just lost. Uh, I know thousands of people who just lost all their important records. So it's a conversation we don't have that much anymore because of all the digital resources we have with us today. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Daniel Shane Holtz asks, is there a downloadable medication card with blood type specificity on the website? So 
Sorry about that. Uh, that RX on the run card that I mentioned, uh, that Healthcare Ready has, uh, we do not currently have a, a prep your health card on our website, but um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you can link to it. We have a link to it uh, in, in several of our blogs, but it's the Healthcare Ready is the name of the organization, and they're the ones that have the RX on the run card that you can fill out in print. And I believe one of the fields on that is uh, your blood type. You can include that type of information. Okay, thank you. Eugene G. Kramer asks, would you recommend the companies that offer meal kits that are advertised as lasting 20 to 25 years? Um, I don't know if I would or would not recommend any company. I know it's, it's just easy these days to have, like someone was mentioning, just rice and beans. Um, very simple things, very shelf stable, will last a very long time. And if you have anything in a can, please make sure you have a manual can opener because we have a lot of families who don't have those anymore. <laughs> okay, and then I've got a couple of questions over here that came in in the chat box, but if anybody has more questions, please enter them into the Q&A. Um, <clears throat> so Teresa asks, are your resources free? Examples, can we download videos and play in our waiting room TVs? Absolutely. All the resources are free online at ready.gov or through the Ad Council. Um, there's also several printed brochures, materials that you can go to our warehouse, order them, and have them sent. And you can have all types of resources in, in your waiting rooms. And please play all those videos. That's exactly what we make them for. They're free. Use them over and over. Thank you. Julie Bannister made a comment <clears throat> um, about current photos of all family members with demographics in the in the record in the event of displacement or separation sorry current photos mm -hmm. so in so case family members get separated i'd say yeah photos and and even with young children uh fingerprints because you may not have that uh for your children just just in case i would also add photos of your pets uh would also classify i think as an important document that you'd want to have um i know that <clears throat> I've seen even the importance of maybe taking a selfie with your pet. So now, not only are you being able to, to prove that you own the pet, but also identify the pet. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Mark Bell also made an interesting suggestion, which is that this, um, along with vital records, take video and pictures of your living space and belongings. If you must evacuate and your home is destroyed, it will be easier to prove to insurance companies what you actually owned. Absolutely. Or in case of a, a house fire, anything that could occur and destroy any of your belongings, have, have some photos of, of the home. Okay. Um, <clears throat> got a question from Robert Alby. Uh, what type of documents would FEMA require for individual assistance? Homeowner documents, would they be accepted if scanned to the cloud? Yes, usually everything um, that's scanned, if it's some type of an official document, can be accepted. You just have to be able to prove uh, if you were a homeowner that you own the home, some type of a deed or a title, or that if you were a renter that you were renting the property, some type of a lease agreement. Great, okay. And it looks like we're um, out of questions here. I'm going to close with uh, one comment from Dennis, who suggested that perhaps next year we should hold this webinar in August so that the content can be used for others to do their promotional work during National Preparedness Month. Thank you, Dennis. That'd be, that'd be great. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you to our presenters and thank you to everyone who joined us today for the webinar. If you do have additional questions, um, if you think of something after we have all logged off, you can email them to epic, E-P-I-C, at cdc.gov. As a reminder, today's presentation has been recorded and you can earn continuing education for your participation. Please follow the instructions found on emergency.cdc.gov backslash epic. The course access code is EPIC0925 with all letters capitalized. Thank you again, everyone. Goodbye.